ordinary day in Worcester, Massachusetts, but wait. Look, down on the ground. It's a germ. It's a worm. It's 508. Bursting from the subterranean depths of Wormtown like the mighty Shy Halud, it's 508, a show about Worcester. It's September the 14th, 2018. I am Michael Benedetti. And this is Brendan Mellican, the co-host, and this is Kevin Oliver, the guest. Hey. Hi, guys. What's happening? Hi, Kevin. How are you doing? I'm good. Kevin, Olive, Kevin Oliver is an interstate traveler and sometime Worcester resident. And, uh, you know, we've done a lot of things. Uh, we've done some interviews of people moving out of Worcester, and Kevin has come back to Worcester at least for a little while. And so we're going to get to do kind of a reverse uh a reverse exit interview, an entrance interview, if you will. Yeah. Don't and we just call those interviews? I guess you just call it an interview. Brendan, we have a lot of other topics we could talk about today. We ha- we could talk about Four Loco. We uh, could. We could talk about the Pawsox deal and parking fees. We could talk about the Catholic clergy abuse scandals. We could talk about, in our dead letter box section, Cornelius Kelly falling off a tiny train. We could talk about this week's city council agenda, the worst city council agenda items of the century, Psycho- psychopathy by state, Worcester's nine most engin- endangered structures besides Gary Rosen's hair, and why conversations are limited to four people, and gold dust. Mike, that's at least three hours worth of programming, and yes. we only have an hour to work with. We're gonna, Where we're are we going to start? Uh, we're going to start with Kevin Oliver. Hi, Kevin. Hey. How you doing? Real good. Welcome back to Worcester. Thanks a lot. I now, like this whole reverse exit interview. Now, Kevin, you are from the, you are from the Midwest originally. Yeah. And then, uh, after a number of times visiting Worcester, you moved to Worcester for a couple of years. I did. Yeah. <laughs> and I then, like Worcester a lot. And then you moved back to the Midwest. Mm-hmm. But now you're back in Worcester for a little while, or at least the w- greater Worcester area. Yeah. So I feel like there are a lot of questions that we ask on the show. Where we try to compare Worcester against other cities. You know, last week, for example, we talked about the statistic that Worcester had the worst drivers in America or the fourth worst drivers in America. Oh, that was just last week you talked that about that? That was just last week. I know you take exception to this claim. I do. I think that Worcester drivers are highly above average. Really? I think Worcester driving is uh, more challenging uh, than your typical American uh, place, city, perhaps. Uh, I mean, I, I've done a lot of uh, country driving, so b- city driving I find to be challenging in general, but then uh, Worcester has its own difficulties, and I feel like folks are aggressive and competent here. So we know that Worcester has, for example, uh, a very high rate of people uh, submitting auto insurance claims. Yeah, and the research, the, the, the statistical data was on behalf of insurance purposes. Yes. So I suppose that would, you know, uh, well, be I one mean, way of looking at researching that topic. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I'll give the, I'll cut them a break in that they actually have information about how often people follow, follow file claims. But you know claims. what, though, Mike? That's actually a re- that t- we kind of dabbled into that a little bit last week, and I think that's the hook, right? Because I mentioned to you last week that a lot of this data comes from in Massachusetts when you sign up for a new insurance policy you get a little device that plugs in your OBD2 reader right, right. And it's going to actually track your driving for 90 days how yes. hard you hit the brakes any collisions how how fast you accelerate and whatnot this is really new to Massachusetts because we just deregulated our insurance industry within the last decade most other places in the country have already gone through this road gone down this road we're literally ripe for the picking when it comes to watching our premiums go through the roof so I think there is something totally valid in saying hey this is well, just we'll take for example <laughs> this this uh, notion of trying to uh, get data on uh, how hard you are hitting the brakes right. and how often and what that means as far as safety of driver. Mm-hmm. Now, y- when I drive in Worcester, I'm constantly slamming on the right. brakes, and it's for safety. Mm-hmm. And I don't know how how you use. I mean, I feel that there's different scenarios in which you slam on the brakes, and and uh, and how how that correlates to. Good driver, bad driver is definitely, I feel, interpretable. Here, here's what I got. Here's a, here's a possible explanation of the data. That um, l- let's accept that Worcester, all that all the statistics are true, and that, for example, versus Brownsville, Texas, which has which is number one on the list, Worcester has way more insurance claims, way more slamming on the brakes. They don't actually have that device in Texas, or at least they didn't until recently, so they don't have that stat for Brownsville. That maybe the issue is that Worcester is a more challenging layout. Sure. And if you, so if you took the people of Brownsville and you dropped them in Worcester, it would be a bloodbath. 
And if you took the people of Worcester and you put them in Brownsville, Texas, there would be no insurance claims ever. Well, yeah. No, I mean, and that's like, imp- I think, Definitely again, from an insurance it. perspective, right? Like most cities at this point are grids uh, or at least they're long stretch. You've probably seen this in the Midwest, right? Like oh, yeah. long stretches of highways where you can actually judge the distance based on the repetition of like Best Buy or like, you know, a Longhorn Stakeout, right? Like, oh, that's got to be 10 miles down the road because I can see a duplicate. Business. And you can also drive a lot faster yeah. and you can also be a lot more asleep at the wheel while you do it. Yeah. And we're, those are differences. And we're literally working with cart roads in Worcester, right? Uh-huh. Like w- we've taken vehicles that can move upwards of 100 miles an hour and placed them on roadways that were designed for a time when we thought nothing could possibly move faster than a horse pulling this big wooden buggy. Kevin, whenever you came back to Worcester this most recent time, did you feel like the city had changed a lot since you were gone or it was more or less the same? I think... It seems more or less the same. I uh, I had a friend uh, who also spent a lot of time in Worcester who came and visited us in Indiana, and he was uh, kind of giving us these scary stories about how Worcester had changed so much mm. since we had left, and I, I didn't find that to be true particularly. Okay. Do you feel... Do, what, I guess I'm... Uh, in terms of the, like, the exit interview and entrance interview thing, like... Having been out of the city for a while, what are you noticing as, like, the pros and the cons of, of Worcester? I, I like Worcester more now than I did before, uh, at least so far. I haven't been here that long to let any of the negative attributes really get me down too much. But yes. I really, uh, I've been appreciating Worcester as a, uh, a, a city with true diversity and um, uh, just a, a lot of... Uh, it's just like a, a great American city in terms of all different types of people doing all different kinds of stuff everywhere you go. Much more so than, uh, say, Bloomington, Indiana, which has uh, a lot of high-quality people, but much more homogenous in terms of their background and what they're and when where they're going in life. Hmm. Is um you know I I've often had that experience when coming back to Worcester after a long absence of really liking the city and that there are just these certain negative things that I feel like follow me around. Eventually, they start following me around in day to day life. Um, you know, when I'm downtown and looking at City Hall, whatever frustration I have about the City Council that month or whatever, these completely uh, ethereal, completely mental constructions. That uh, you know, I just lose I just lose those things when I'm away for a while, and then when I come back, it takes a while for them to come back. And I wish that I could see it through fresh eyes every morning. Mm, yeah. Uh, well, when I first the first day when I got here, I was like, "This is great. I love Worcester. It's so wild and and um, chaotic and uh, diverse, and there's all these things going on." And then I drove across town to Lincoln Square and went to Savers and I had a terrible time. It just seemed really, um, everyone was seemed uh, like there was a mean edge mm. to everyone and everyone was just kind of, I don't know, I just had a lousy uh, personal experience. And then also driving back from Savers back into town, I almost wrecked. It was my own fault. It was at rush hour last Friday. Hey, and you're throwing off the stats, man. Yeah, well, here you I are not used great, to the Worcester is, driving challenge. This is a great a- anecdote that goes against the statistical data, which is that I made a mistake merging onto Grove Street. I pulled out in front of a truck who was coming, and um, I caused several vehicles to slam on their brakes and kind of like uh, become perpendicular to the street. No one honked. Uh, no one crashed. Uh, they just allowed me to uh, make a mistake, and then we all just re-entered traffic, and everything was fine. Yeah. Any other town I did that in, I would have been T-boned for sure. Yeah, see, I, and I think that's where uh, Worcester really shows its adultness, right? Because, I mean, I think we all know that the secret to being an adult is acknowledging you have no idea what's going on. And you just got to pretend like you got everything sorted out and in order. And every once in a while, we stumble, we make a mistake. The rest of us, the adults, we just Staying let that, alert. We let that slide. I yeah. can't believe we're doing a show about how good Worcester drivers are. <laughs> this is, seems so insane to me. Are we, are we ready to go to a break? Hey, all you juggalos, libertarians, eclectic change makers, and passionate Worcesterites, this is the 508 Show. We'll be back after these messages with more. This is the water, and this is the well. Drink full and descend. The horse is the white of the eye and dark within. This is the water, and this is the well. Drink full and descend. 
The horse, the horse is the white of the, of the eye, eye and dark, dark within. within. And this is Brendan Malikin. And this is Kevin Oliver. And I am Michael Benedetti, the white of the eye and dark within. And this is the 508 show. We have so many t- potential topics, but we also have Kevin Oliver himself. A whole show was worth of topics right there, Brendan. We should let Kevin choose a topic. Do you want to, this is the this is the list. I like talking about things we have nothing to we, we know nothing about, Kevin. So if you I feel like if, if nothing on this list excites you, we should talk about uh, suggestions for improvement that you have for Worcester. Now that you defended <laughs> our driving abilities, which again seems I saw this uh, thing about Cornelius Kelly. That interests me. Uh, Kelly Square interests me. Well, I'll tell you, I've been doing as I sometimes do a lot of research about weird stuff. The last week I've been doing a lot of research about Kelly Square. I've been doing research about Cornelius Kelly the namesake of Kelly Square, and I've been doing research on the historical changes in the layout of Kelly Square. Mm, uh-huh. Like, how did Kelly Square come to be what it is? Uh, and my short answer on that is, I think it was like a death by a thousand cuts, or the straw that broke the camel's back. It was, they just did a bunch of stuff to this intersection over about a century, and at some point, it was like, oh no, you've really gone too far now. This is a <laughs> terrible idea. And that's how we got Kelly Square. Well, there's several nodes in Worcester where they're so strange because they used to be bridges over the buried river. Yes. Mm. That yeah. So that so that's a big part of it, right? Uh, you know, I think that. Um, I mean, I, I'll tell you this: in eight, in 1830, when the canal first opened up, Kelly Square was a pretty ordinary intersection. You know, you had you had uh, Vernon slash Green Street. Is that right? Am I getting the streets straight? Vernon slash Green Vernon Street. coming down. You had Green coming down from the north and Vernon going out from the south. You had, uh, and then you had like uh, Water Street going into Millbury Street. Mm-hmm. You basically had two streets intersecting and on either side of the intersection, the street names changed. Right. But there, there's nothing about the intersection that was confusing. It was just two streets coming together at a non 90 degree angle. And you had a canal which was running along water in Millbury. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there was a little bridge on Green Street getting you over the top of that canal. And that was at the the square, so maybe that bridge did something for, you know, slowed something down at some point for somebody. But it was just basically an intersection. It's also important to point out, you said that was 1830, right? Yeah. So, I mean, there was nothing to slow down in 1830, except for maybe the mud rolling down Vernon Street, right? Like, the, we were not dealing combustion engines at this point. Again, that, yes. that's the fastest thing moving was a horse and maybe a light rail. Yes. Well, so then, and then, you know, the uh, the canal closed, mm-hmm. and then by in the some point in the 1890s, they built uh, Harding Street over the top of the canal. Yeah. They and you know they just sort of put like an arch over the top of the canal, and then they put like boards on that, and then they put like dirt on that, and then they put uh, pavement on top of that, and they were like, and there's a brand new street going through Kelly Square. It's exactly parallel to these other street that was going through Kelly Square. So now we have two streets pretty close together, parallel going through with another street intersecting them. I feel that the, the straw that breaks the camel's back is at some point, I think in the 40s, when they punch Madison Street through, because Madison Street did not always go into Kelly Square. It used to just sort of run into another part of Green Island. It didn't seem like it was such a through street. Uh, at some point, they got Madison to cross the railroad tracks, and then they got Madison... So you didn't have to drive through this little maze of streets to get to Kelly Square mm-hmm. and elsewhere. It just went right to Kelly Square. And that's when you're screwed because now you have all this traffic from bet- from Vernon Street that's coming down. It's Maybe it's going to go straight down Green. Maybe it's going to go sideways down Madison. Meanwhile, you got these these other like parallel streets kind of stuck in there. Right. So what about uh, – I'm assuming that the bypass going through there and dumping out into Kelly Square was probably a major – issue at, in its day. I can't with, figure out when it happened. It's driving me nuts. I've been lo- talking to people. I've been looking at records. I cannot find any maps of Worcester at a very fine-grained level between, let's say, 1935 and 1955. I know that before 35-ish, before 25 at least, uh, there wasn't the bypass, there wasn't the extension, and then after 55, there definitely was the extension. Are you talking about 290? I'm not talking about yeah. 290. I'm talking about the Madison Street extension. Oh, okay. 290 happens in the 60s, right. and I feel like 290 is just like the uh, the cherry on top of the cherry on top of the cherry right. on top of the Sunday. It's just like every every generation decides to do something that maybe doesn't seem completely extreme, but does seem like 
a pretty heavy duty move. There's also one of those things there too, and I think it, whether you're talking Madison Street or you're talking uh, 290, uh, that we've since learned. But going back to like the highway bill, 50, 40s, 50s, 60s period of building out highways, we didn't actually understand that there's a psychology to, behind driving on a highway when you're going like 80 miles an hour, and that's just the standard. Yeah. You get off that off ramp. Yeah. It takes a little while for your yeah. brain to figure out like, okay, we're back Kelly to Square. 30 mile an hour yeah, zone. Yeah. You get off the highway, you're in this crazy intersection. Never mind like dropping down to like two mile an hour zone and exactly. like okay i gotta look 16 ways to make sure i got the clear and whatnot it, coming off 290 is crazy and then also the other direction folks coming down chandler on madison in trying to get to 290 they're already ramping up psychologically to like oh, okay yeah. go on the highway ready to go yeah and yeah you, you got that thing that just bogs you down for that couple seconds which is enough to really throw you for a loop psychologically you know i i think it's it's only when i started looking at a lot of maps that i realized how close the interstate goes to kelly square that there's a couple streets that come into uh Vernon Street, uh, I think it's Dix and Jefferson Street, Okay. where you, you look at the map, you would have looked at the map before and said, do I want to count these as part of Kelly Square? Maybe I do. They kind of seem like they're part of Kelly Square, you know, uh, you know, who knows? And then at some point, between those and the square itself, they put the freaking interstate highway. <laughs> like, yeah. that's how close. They yeah. just wedge it right in there. And you're like, well, yeah. now they're definitely not part of Kelly Square because there's an interstate in the way. But, like, yeah, uh, again, every generation just making its own uh, bold move to making Kelly Square slightly more busy. I think Kelly Square is the best place. You just highlighted it in a weird way that locally, uh, growing up around here, one of the more provincial things we have going for us is this weird uh, east-west divide, right? And it's always yes. been predicated on the idea that 290, when built, really separated the city in half. Kelly Square is the place where you see it, because you're, you're right. Like, there there's a neighborhood on the other side of 290 that really doesn't identify with, you know, other another neighborhood that's just separated by this right. highway. It's, what, 100 feet apart from each other? At one point in time was just backyards that you could right. run around and play in. But there's no longer, I mean, getting between them now requires you to walk across a bridge, and there's not that many bridges, and it's no longer, I mean, it's no longer connected. Right. right. So yeah. you're exactly right. It's not the same neighborhood anymore. Um, the one thing, so I, I also was doing a lot of research about Cornelius Kelly. Um, one thing that I learned that was interesting, Brendan, is that um, how you get a square named after you. Do you know how you do get a square named after you? You probably know better than me. I don't. I just hope it doesn't have to involve uh, mustard gas. My under, my understanding is that you uh, you know you would talk to whatever maybe civic commission and then you would pay the city some money, and then you would get a square named after your loved me? one who died. I think it is. I think it is a little bit like getting a star on the Hollywood you Walk pay. of Fame. This is my understanding. So that there are people, like there are Spanish American War uh, dead who have squares, mm -hmm. um, and so at least in the early 20s they already had the square thing going. So it's not just a World War One thing. Okay. By no means does every World War One uh, casualty have a square. Okay. There's fewer squares than there are World War One casualties. Just not to speak of World War Two, Vietnam, but there's people who have squares named after them who died. In, one guy died in Grenada. I believe that one man died in Iraq who has a square named after him. Hmm. So it's something that you can, uh, you know, it is something that you could consider doing. I have no, I've never thought that it was something that could happen again. It just seemed like it was something from the depths of time, but apparently not. Do you have to be dead? No, I don't think that's true. I don't think you that's true. You have to true. be alive. You have to pay. I bet you you have to be dead when the square, Isn't I it? bet you they're not going to name a square after a living person, but I bet you you don't have, I don't think you have to die in combat. It's been a lifelong dream of mine to have a urinal named after me at some point in time. I want a little brass plaque by a urinal, but if I can figure out a way to get a square going. Well, I my only, you know, I'm always looking for these things where I sort of find something that I, uh, you know, have, do not otherwise see mentioned in, or in the secondary sources. And the one thing that I found was this article from, um, I believe it is the October 21st, 1918 issue of the Telegram. Uh, they used to just, they ran a ton of news about people who were over in Europe in World War One, and they would just sometimes run their letters to their family, which is really an interesting use of the newspaper. Um, and I feel like it's honestly not something like... I mean, like during the during the the heaviest days of the Iraq War, did you feel like you were reading lots of letters home from soldiers? No, that I, strikes me as like the like whatever it, the World War One version of a listicle. Yeah, yes. or I mean, it just it just feels like it seems like such a private thing. Yeah. The idea of like like maybe you would see some big as some big public thing, but it's not like oh yeah, I just stumble across dozens of these letters home a day. But that's how it was in the newspaper huh. in during in the. Uh, 
during the first well, world war. Well, I guess war. that makes sense though too. That's probably pre-correspondent uh, days, right? Like you're not the, the likelihood of the telegram having a a, a desk, you know, somewhere right, in Europe right. where they're able to do war correspondence. That was probably the best version of uh, of news uh, coming through in the most timely manner, unless you want to wait for the War Department to issue a release. Well, my my understanding is that there's not a ton of. Uh, primary sources about Cornelius Kelly, but that but that one of the primary sources we have about Cornelius Kelly is this letter home. Um, this letter was written uh, three weeks before uh, Kelly was in an incident where there was a mustard, mustard gas attack, and, and I believe he was in the hospital for like a week with mustard gas injuries and then died, which just seems so miserable. Yeah. But anyway, before all that happened, this is after Kelly uh, did the things which got him the Silver Star and many acts of courage. Uh, there's a letter to the telegram from a Sergeant John Sergeant John McNulty, I guess a letter to his family, which they gave to the telegram, uh, where he talks about him, uh, Sergeant Rassicott, and Cornelius Kelly, and some other guys, not, non-Worcester guys, uh, discovering a light-gauge German railroad in the midst of some other stuff that they were doing, realizing, like, we could totally coast these this, rail, this railroad car down a hill because we're at the top of a hill and we have the railroad car. Let's do it. And then not crashing the railroad car, but the railroad car throwing them all out onto the ground whenever it got down to the hill and, and b- bottom and curved around, wow. putting uh, putting McNulty in the hospital for a week. That kind of sounds like the perfect euphemism, euphemism for late night in Kelly Square. <laughs> I, you know, it's a great it's a great story. The the hundredth anniversary of Kelly's death is coming up in uh, this October in just a couple of weeks, and there is a group who, um, in some way. Are connected to the uh, the old Yankee Yankee Regiment, I guess, whatever it was that Kelly was a part of, whatever di- Yankee Division, I guess. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they're going to be doing a you know a, a little funeral type memorial huh. type cer- ceremony for the hundredth de- anniversary of his death. Again, a, a courage a courageous guy who did multiple acts of courage was recognized by both America and France for these acts of courage. And then uh, just like a month before the war ended in the middle of heavy fighting, was hit by this mustard gas attack mm. and, you know, presumably burned off his skin, burned out his lungs, and then somehow didn't die immediately. Ugh, Cornelius Kelly. It's a hard life. Do you want to, do you want to complain about this baseball stadium this week, or do you want to... Do, do you want, want to complain about the baseball do, stadium? I, I guess yeah. I was just curious from a narrative perspective. Like, so... I feel like we're still on the stage, the early stages of the public digesting what this deal means exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and we're already at the final stages of legislative action around yeah. this in that the city has committed 100%. Mm-hmm. Council's voted, let's do it. The um, end of Kelly Square. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> one thing. Square. is that This is one reason I've been re- researching Kelly Square is that it's po- depending on how they re-engineer things, maybe Kelly Square goes away or at least as a recognizable uh, you could crazy. nightmare. You could be that footnote to, to Worcester history that actually memorializes and captures the reality of Kelly Square. I hope so. I hope you and so. a bumper, sc- bumper sticker declaring that you survived it. But um, I, I guess I'm just wondering, like, I think if I think if it, I think if the decision of whether or not to do the baseball thing were down the line, mm-hmm. then if we said positive aspects or negative aspects, that would be seen as sort of part of this general lobbying effort or rallying effort. And so, you're, okay, you're saying negative things because you want the council to vote no, or positive things to vote yes. Considering that's already in the past, how do we want to frame it whenever I want to go on here and say, well, here's a part of the deal that looks terrible? Yeah. How do I frame that besides just being like, I want to say something negative? Yeah, I don't know, because I, I think we're in a post-nuance uh, period in American history, and we I think are. that's actually the problem, right? Like, you, you can't actually have a meaningful conversation with something with somebody publicly about a, a big topic and really want to dice it up and get into the weeds on it without just getting shut down over bits and pieces that, yeah, I don't know. Are we ready to go to a break? We're ready to go. This is 508 Worcester's Libertarian Voice. We'll be back in a minute with more. Live from our studio in a basement down an alley in downtown Worcester, this is 508. I'm Michael Benedetti, and today on the show, our guest is from the mighty Midwest, Kevin Oliver. How you doing? And from the mighty West Side, Brendan Milliken. I'm shaking, Mike. Um, so let's. I want to talk about this parking lot thing. So we should just we just want to mention real quick for people um, who aren't watching on Facebook. There's a great article by Neil DeMouse and Deadspin. Uh, Neil had written previous stuff complaining about the stadium deal, and then I think he'd gotten some pushback, and then uh, wrote a much longer thing about the stadium deal, where he still uh, seems to feel like it's a very bad thing. But he also goes into uh, the background of Zimbalist, 
who is the econ- much touted economist that the city hired to help us with this, a guy who has gone on record many a time uh, opposing stadium deals, and so the fact that he supported it seemed like it was very significant. And I don't think that Neil DeMouse calls him uh, a, a corrupt economist with no integrity, but uh, I feel like that is the information that is presented him hear about him. He, he, he seems to go about the roundabout way of presenting a reality where your average academic sports economist uh, is not getting retirement money from being an academic sports economist. And there's this very lucrative market uh, for being a consultant for hire, uh, oftentimes for sometimes both a team and a municipality at the same time. And, and, and as the way I read the this Deadspin piece, he was simultaneously functioning for the Paw Sox in Pawtucket and Worcester in Worcester over the same sort of deal, it's right? It's kind like, of incredible. It kind of is incredible. In a, in a, like, good job, Zimbalist, honestly. Yeah, I mean... It, it, if you're, he's good at his own economics, whether or not he's good at stadium economics. If I mean, you're not driving a Lambo, I'm going to be really, really upset with you. Cause, it, yeah. yeah, it really does read like it's a professional mathematician who you know has written many papers saying 1 plus 1 equals 2, and yep. then whenever your checkbook comes out, He'll be like, actually, in this case, 1 plus 1 equals 3, 1 plus 1 equals 0, whatever it needs to equal in this case. And then the rest of the time, he's like, but I've always, you know, I have a great record of arithmetic. You know, I have a great record of arithmetic, except when I'm getting paid, I have a great record. So I have a lot of credibility. It's even more it's, it's even more creative than that, though, where he, he he's very quick to come out and say, look, the stadium deal, no win. Terrible idea. You're not going to make a penny off the stadium. But when you start bundling in, like in the case of Worcester, 18, 20 acres worth of development on top of that, Mm -hmm. uh, virgin development, right? Because we're talking nothing existing right now. Um, Then suddenly there's a revenue stream. And in some cases, he's very correct. In other cases, he's very wrong. Uh, That also seems very similar to taking your money to Vegas. Yeah, I, I, I want to read some stuff about parking, and then, Kevin, you can you can, uh, you can can talk, and Brendan, you can talk. Um, I have a couple of documents. So um, Nicole Apostola, who ra- rarely writes a blog post, wrote a nice blog post called Non-Table Talk, Pie in the Sky, where she just sort of talks about this and that and the other thing. And then finally, you know whenever uh, the thing, she gets to the thing she cares about, because suddenly the article is full of white-hot passion and clarity, the section about parking. I think I said it a couple of weeks ago, like, I was concerned about the level of complexity about this. Like, mm-hmm. can anybody talk about this? Can any counselor actually understand this? I like this idea of saying, well, let's take a chunk of it, right. the parking part. And the parking part, Brendan, is not like half a percent. It's like 16% of this deal, mm-hmm. of 16% of the revenue that will pay for the money that we borrow. Right is going to come from the parking part of this. So this understanding the parking part of this is understanding 16% of this deal. Uh, Nicole writes, the city will own the proposed 500 space parking garage, which will be leased to Madison Development Holdings. In the first year, it's projected that we get $559,810 in real estate taxes and $250,000 for the lease, and also that the city would get another $600,000 in revenue in other lots due to events at the stadium. This can be found on page five of the city auditor's letter, Mm -hmm. which indeed it can. Um... He says event parking is estimated at $600,000, of which $500,000 is assumed from 1,100 spaces for 66 home games using an average rate of 675. So the idea is that uh, various city lots charging basic or premium rates are identified. The rates and increases are agreed to in the letter of intent with rates for basic parking set at $5 for home games and $10 for premium lots. Premium lots including Federal Plaza, Worcester Common, Union Station, and McGrath lots. Also assumed as parking revenue from 12 other events, 12 non-baseball events, at an average rate of $8 a a spot, generating annual revenue of $100,000. Based on a study of available city spaces for projected team events and city events, the annual parking revenue for events may exceed $900,000 in year one. So Nicole goes on to say, uh, in 2015, all city-owned street off-street lots brought in $300,000. We were in the red on them because mm-hmm. costs were higher than that $300,000. Uh, and Federal Plaza and Union Station, both similar-sized garages to the one proposed, brought in an average income of $469,000 in the red due to expenses. Let's assume for the moment that we will get $809,000-ish from Madison Development Holdings in the first year for the for the new garage, and just focus on the part of this that, that's dependent on existing city-owned parking lots. So the question is, do we make enough money 
from existing city-owned parking lots because of the WUSOX that we can pay 16% of the money we borrowed. Uh, the only way, she says, we could get $600,000 in parking revenue in the first year is if the city charges $5 a car during events for Woo Sox games. Mm-hmm. As, she, as you know, this points out, actually, it's going to be a little higher on average because some will be 5 and some will be 10 uh, Which that seems exceedingly low to me, to be honest with you. Like embarrassingly low. Yeah. Okay. So, so but go ahead. Say, yeah. say this to me here in a second. Uh, all, that if, if this is true, that if all 600, 980 city-owned parking lot spaces, including Highland Street, the McGrath lot, the Amtrak MBTA lot, and the Expressway Area C lot on Grafton Street, would be used exclusively for 125 POSOX events, and we get volunteers to collect the cash required. Because, of course, if we spend money, I mean, this is just talking about the profit that you make. If Mm -hmm. you have to somehow pay money to run the lots, then the whole thing goes out the window. According to the auditor and the pro forma for the deal, in the first year, and presumably up to year 15, parking from the city-owned lots, excluding the garage, will account for 16% of the revenue to pay down the bond. My suspicion is that, as with so many other economic development activities, city-owned parking will appear to be in the red to subsidize a business. There it is, Brendan. There it is. Uh, yeah, I don't know. No, I, I so look, I, I I don't take any issue with anything Nicole is saying in in terms of uh, some of the issues in general with, with like the parking structure down there, but I think pegging numbers at five and ten dollars that's yeah. That, that, it's, so you think we should be? You think we could get away with charging a lot more? Unless it's 1980 and I and I missed something. I, I paid twenty five dollars a day to park in Boston just to go to work every day for five years. That's you think we can? You think? I mean, how much can you charge for a spot? At, at, on, a, on the Highland Street lot. Well, I don't know that we would be game. looking on, on Highland Street as much. I mean, I, I know oh, it's I mean, figured it's into here. It's part of everybody's. Both, the, both of these statistics are assuming that all of these That spots everything are being gets used. packed and, and bounced around. No, I, I get that. and it's, But I think the. Yeah, so if you're going to Gillette Stadium to, to see a Patriots game, you're mm-hmm. paying, you're starting at 45 bucks for parking. Right. That's just parking. Like you know, and I know this is minor league baseball. That's totally something different. But I think this is also where we need to start. We need, to, we need to be realistic and realize that we're not just talking to Worcester here, right, and maybe Paxton and Holden. We're, we're talking to 1.5 million people in, in Worcester County directly, and we're talking to a couple million people outside of that county from, like, a bigger metropolitan area and whatnot. And the idea of driving someplace and forking over $10, $15, $20 for parking isn't that big of a deal. Like, that's... Well, so this so this is something which um, I mean that's what you're going to pay if you're going to see a show at the Centrum or the Palladium, right? I, like I'll accept that what you're saying is true. I, th- I I then think it's weird that the people who put together this deal when they were doing the parking section, which again is not uh, small potatoes, uh, just said yeah five ten so five bucks and ten bucks yeah sure, no and whatever. maybe that's and, it. and we're going to yeah. fill like every space basically I'm, in the city. I'm kind of going to the long about right, the the long way around of saying I I'm confused because yeah it seems like the experts involved uh, are. They well, should they should have put fifteen dollars spaces on this. But there's got to be a reason why they didn't, right? Because Zimbalist had a had, <laughs> was waiting on his check here, right? Okay. So I mean, I, I have to imagine he put some thought guy. into this. Let's I only, just, yep. Yeah, no, I mean, I I, I think there's there's got to be something there that's missing, and also as well the, the number of um um no, I mean the the parking down there is just going to be so bizarre to begin with, right? And it's um I, I think this is this is this is one of the big hangups that I have with the project overall. Like you said, we're, you, you re, actually read the study, and you're now getting up onto Highland Street. That's not a reasonable, uh, from a Worcester perspective, that's not a reasonable distance to cover for someone to park. Like, are there going to be, a, 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 I would guess, a bus? But, but Mike, that's that's less than you would walk if you're going to a Red Sox game. I did go to a, a, a guy's house over in in that area the other day, and he, he had just sold the house. And he was getting rid of some stuff, and I helped a friend move some things out that she had purchased, and I bought a record player for $5 off this guy. And he was a little sad because he would just sold the house with his brother and sister, and they had been really eager to sell, but he was hoping to have mm-hmm. held on to the house because he was assuming that it was going to go up in value a lot because of the Paw Sox deal. He was very excited. He was, he was saying that the real estate mm-hmm. in the neighborhood was going to become more valuable. I forget yeah. what street the house was on. Wait, is it, yeah. No, and it, it well. This is the stuff though that I I feel like a lot of what we're we're picking apart is again from a very Worcester centric perspective. If I were to go to a Red Sox game, if I were to go to anything in Boston, the distance from that municipal lot on Highland Street to where this stadium is going to be 
at a minimum an eighth of the distance that I'm actually going to walk in Boston to go to that event, right? Like, if I'm going to go to an event in Manhattan, like, that's maybe one one one-hundredth of the distance that I'm going to walk to get to that. And I'm not comparing Worcester to Manhattan. It's like... That's not a long distance, Mike. That's a that's what a ten fifteen minute walk from Highland Street down to the the. You're walking the, you're stadium? walking half the length of Main Street. That's it. That's like, I mean, it is. No, you're walking longer than that because then you no, have to walk not. down the walk down the way to the stadium, which is at the end of the entrance is the end of the Green Street Bridge. So you're you're literally walking less than half of Main Street. I guess it's not that far. No, I mean, it, I mean yeah, it's pretty far, but it's maybe it's, not it's that far, far. It's far by today's standards, or I think in a lot of our minds, because there's nothing in between. And as somebody who does a lot of walking, I know we've talked about this before, you and I, that you do a lot of walking. That part of the problem in Worcester is that you get to these areas of the city where there's just there's it's a no man's land. There's nothing to catch your eye. There's just there's vacancy. There's there's emptiness. Yes. And that's when your brain starts firing on over you know overdrive, and it's like you start getting a little antsy and agitated. The more density that you find along a walking path, the less you even notice that you're walking a distance. I mean, uh, right. But I, I guess I still, if I, you know, if I had to have, I have guests in, in from out of town this weekend. Certainly mm-hmm. not, and certainly not uh, shrinking violets of guests at all. Sure. Definite, definite badasses. But like, I feel like if if we were going to a thing at the Green Street Bridge, mm-hmm. you know, if we were going to a thing at uh, St. John's or whatever, maybe. And, or at the Union Station, and we had to park at Highland Street for that, I would definitely be a little apologetic and say there is a bit of a walk. It's Highland Street at Main Street. It's because it's behind the auditorium. So, I mean, like, just in comparison, if I, if, if I go to a show at the Palladium, I park at my business on Highland Street, the corner of Highland and West. Yeah. I walk down Highland, and then I go down, you know, bank a right on Main Street and down to the Palladium. It's essentially the same distance you're talking. Maybe you're maybe throwing a couple hundred yards in extra. Uh, but it's... Yeah, it's really not that far. You're right. You, you'd be right to apologize because it's a weird, grim walk. It's not like walking. Maybe that's to, the five dollar spot. That's the five dollar spot. <laughs> it's it's a weird, grim walk because you're not. There's nothing to see in between. It's not gonna be like, oh, hey, let's pop in here because there's something yeah. cool going on. It's. I like how, I like how this show is all about urban, like sort of this form of urban imagination of trying to like how accurately can we visualize these street configurations well i saw your hand-drawn maps of uh, kelly square yeah and oh, i mean that's I, that's the other thing that i was, that i can now hand draw you a map that's 100 percent accurate of kelly square which is very uh, something i never thought i would that's have. my next tattoo mike um this is 508 worcester's week by week good faith survey of evidence and traffic visualization we'll be back with more Out, out are the lights, out all, and over each quivering form, the curtain of funeral pall comes down with the rush of a storm, and the angels all pallid and wan, uprising, unveiling a firm, that the play is the tragedy man. And its hero, the Conqueror Worm. Live from the hidden depths of Wormtown, this is 508 with Kevin Oliver, our special guest. Hello. From the Midwest. Kevin, who you can also hear many a day on WCUW Radio in Worcester. How often do you, are you on WCUW? Uh, well, I'm, I'm going down there on Monday mornings because I like to hang out with Paul Lozon, playing the oldies. He lets me bring a stack of 45s in and we play them together. Nice. He has a new girlfriend who's also co-hosting the show with him. He has other silent partners down there that don't speak but are always there. Do we want to do we want to talk about city council agenda items? Do we want to talk about some less painful topic? Let's just talk about something we know nothing about. It's easier that way, Mike. Get too many opinions in the first. Uh, you know, I do have a stu- I do have a study this week. This is an actual legit study called Psychopathy by U.S. State or Psychopathy by U.S. State. Does Worcester also rank? Uh, you know, Massachusetts actually more or less average. Okay. I mean, a little on the high side, but more or less average. Like this is cool. Go on with this. Topic. Uh, I mean, so uh, this is so this is from Ryan Murphy at Southern Methodist University, and this is is in posted. This is on the website SSRN, where a lot of social science research things are posted before they are submitted to other journals and uh, Ryan Murphy is the research assistant professor at the O'Neill Center for Global Markets and Freedom at Southern Methodist University School of Business he is talking about he looks at the big five personality traits are you familiar with this model of personality Brendan you're talking about the Myers-Briggs stuff this is it's kind of like Myers-Briggs but it's 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 kind of the more more recent and more considered to be more legit it's like there's it says that there's like five basic personality traits and we can kind of 
score you on them, and by that we can give you the personality profile. They're like so a openness, slightly, slightly more refined version of astrology, is what you're saying. Uh, you know, I mean, they're 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 like I'm trying to remember if I can think of them. Openness, conscientiousness, mm, yeah, uh, extroversion, uh, uh, how neurotic you are, and how agreeable you are. Okay. And that's what they are. So he is looking at the he's looking at state level research of just doing surveys of people and saying like what's people's personality. Well, he says while a very small percentage of individuals in any given state may actually be true psychopaths, I hope that's true. <laughs> the level of psychopathy present on average within an aggregate population is a distinct research question. Uh, while empirical operation opera, while empirical Operan, operal, operas, operationalizations, operationalizations. That's by, a tough one. That's a stupid I'm word. I'm so Mike. tired of psychopathy. Frequently treated as a binary categorization, the hair psychopathy checklist treats it as a spectrum. So this is just sort of saying like how much psychopathy is there in a state, and this method. He says they simply subtract the scores for neuroticism, agreeableness, and conscientiousness from extroversion. Uh, and that this is, uh, in some research methodology, considered a legitimate way to measure how psychopathic hmm. a person or a group of an organization, group of people are. So again, uh, the more neurotic you are, the more agreeable you are, and the more conscientious you are, the less psychopathic you are. And the more extroverted you are... Psychopathy the, is not neurosis? Uh, we don't. This is not a psychology podcast, so there's no way we can get into that question. <laughs> anyway, the, the more extroverted you are, the more psycho you are, and like the less oh, you have of these better. other traits, the less psycho you are. Oh, really? And uh, yeah, and so the, the average psycho American state is, uh, as according to this, Arizona. Hmm. Uh, the mo the least psycho is my own home state of West Virginia. Congratulations. States such as North Carolina also doing quite well on this. Uh, the most psycho by a country mile this is the District of Columbia. Hmm. That if huh. if if the average is zero, yep. there's some plus some minus. So the average would be zero. The average state would be at a zero. DC is 3.5. You know what's interesting about that? Massachusetts is is 0.5. I was reading a study this week. Can't remember where it was from. Can't remember who wrote it. Which means I might as well be making this up. But I promise that I'm not. That uh, humans able to determine uh, the trustworthiness and the likelihood that somebody is to engage in corruption by just looking at their face. And the study was done uh, with politicians, but the, yes. the, 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 the viewers were not familiar with who the politicians were. And the thing that they honed in on uh, was the width of somebody's face. Yet the wider your face, the more l reliable you are, or the less reliable. The more likely someone was to, to to finger you as someone likely to commit an act of corruption, but also lining up perfectly with who that person actually was as a historical figure, and that they were wow. in fact corrupt and whatnot. But huh. I'm just bringing it back to, to DC. Huh. Yeah. I mean, I I sort of feel like I mean, I I really like the title of this study, and I really like the idea of this study, and I feel like. Uh, you know, it doesn't seem like a very legitimate study. <laughs> like, just saying, like, we're going to see, uh, we're going to subtract, we're just going to basically, it's like, if your state's really extroverted and these other pr properties are kind of blah, mm -hmm. then you're probably full of psychos. That seems like a little bit of an iffy proposition to me or an iffy way to measure. I mean, you're measuring something. You're measuring extroversion minus everything else. Yeah. But I'm not sure that calling that psych being a psychopath is... Uh, substantiated. Anyway. Well, it doesn't have to be, like, you know, knife in the bathroom, uh... Psycho psychopathy, right? Like we're just talking yeah. about general sort of like antisocial behavior, like you know, I there's a couple people who I have met, uh, who I've met, and then uh, medical psychological pr professionals who have who have worked on them have then told me that these people are psychopaths, mm -hmm. and then I've had a, other interact additional interactions with them after that, and I would say that for the couple of people who I have been told by clinicians are psychopaths. I wouldn't have pegged that they were psychopaths. Huh. I would have just said that they were whatever. Do we have any clinicians that are fans of this show that can watch us and our history of uh, of guests and whatnot? And that's that's, that's gonna, I feel like that kind of remote diag diagnosing is considered to be uh, unhealthy, unethical, Brown probably a bad idea. I mean, this yeah, is right. like saying this is like trying to say like what kind of crazy person the president is, 
and it's like you need to be sitting down with him in a room for a while and uh, go through a thing. You can't just like watch some speeches and decide, okay, I know what this guy's deal is. Yeah, you can't read Twitter and determine somebody's mental state. You would think our level of extroversion was very high based on this show, and also our le- our level of agreeableness was very low. But actually, the opposite is true. I'm super introverted, and I'm actually kind of a nice. We're guy. both very laid back, cool, cool <laughs> dudes. As is Kevin Oliver. Yeah. Hey there, Kevin Oliver. How's it going? Hey, pretty good. I liked the uh, facial analysis idea, but then based on the width, I wasn't thinking that that was facial analysis anymore. I was I was more into the idea of like looking at the the face that you're making. Yeah, no, and when I was reading it, I wish I could remember where it came from. It was probably just some random Reddit link, but it was to an actual study, um, and it was weird because that part just kind of, I felt like it popped up on me. I was like, yeah, I could totally judge where somebody's at from you know, making some eye contact and watching facial expressions and whatnot. And then it really drilled in on that, like, people were honing in on the width of somebody's face. And like I, I Maybe th- that means that they're, they're you know, oh their eyes God. are too close together, therefore their brain is too small or something. I don't know. I, yeah. I, have to, I totally have to interrupt because I forgot about the most important thing. Do we have time for the most important thing? This may be the most important thing we're ever going to do on this show, so this is good. So this week in Worcester Magazine, Bill Shaner has a nice article called The Top Ten Worst City Council Orders. Um, and I just want to, you know, give myself a little credit that I, I was, I threw a couple of the orders his way that he listed in there. Did but he doesn't job. actually have my favorite council order of all time. Mm-hmm. He does have Gary Rosen's order request the city manager consider the feasibility of introducing rubber sidewalks in the city of Worcester. Yes, which is just beautiful, mm-hmm. and it's like a little haiku of a crazy city council order. But from the same year, 2006, July the 18th, 2006, earlier in the year, we had a, a, a twofer. Mm-hmm. We had first Kate or second Kate Toomey saying, request city manager consider including podcasting as an option for information about Worcester that is posted on our website and be it further requested that podcasting be added to previously voted requests that concern how we upgrade our communication through technology. Sure. And then the one that to me it gets at the gets at the soul of why we talk about Gary Rosen so much on this show. Mm-hmm. Why I love him. Why I own a Gary Rosen shirt that is signed by Gary Rosen. Request city manager. Request Department of Public Health to report to city council any and all efforts that are planned to be taken to protect the public health and safety against a possible infestation of rats when the demolish demolition of the majority of the Worcester Common Outlet Mall is undertaken. Yeah. The rat attack. Wow. The rat, and it, you know, I don't mean. Did it ever get answered? Did we were we attacked by rats? We were. Did were we attacked by rats? Was I there a rat? No, I No, I don't know. No. Is that the downtown, the Worcester Common Outlet Mall? Is that the? Uh, it was. That's yeah, the one that's not. It's not there anymore. Huh? Yeah. Oh, uh, I didn't even notice. I'm right here. 